You know, this morning we're going to talk about the love of God. I, I said in the promotion that I sent out that we're going to just explore the love of God. And I also said that we're just going to scratch the surface. We're going to scratch the surface. We can't go very deep in the next 35 or so minutes into this subject. So we're just going to scratch the surface. But I think what you're going to find, even just by us scratching the surface of this subject, the love of God, that it's going to scratch you in a way that will bring you some relief and comfort in your soul. It, and it's going to minister to the, the deepest need that we as human beings have is the need to be loved. And so I'm so excited about this particular subject that we're going to address this morning. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I'm very grateful uh, that I have this opportunity. And I, I really feel always just um, very undeserving to share the word of God, but also I feel very incompetent. And so I, I really appreciate your prayers as I present this particular message on the love of God. And this is not my opinion. I, my opinion is not worth very much. Uh, if I share with you something and, and I say it's absolute truth, but it's only based on my opinion, don't believe it. If I say it's absolute truth and it's based upon the truth of God's word, then believe it. That's where the authority lies for our discussion this morning on the love of God. Our text this morning that we're going to begin with is in 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. And I'm going to give you a chance to uh, turn there if you have your Bible or on your phone. And we'll also have it on the screen uh, behind us. 1 John chapter 4 verses 7 through 11. And as we read this passage, these five verses that we're going to read, I want you to notice how often the word love is used just in these five verses, okay? So here it is, 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. It says, Beloved, let us love one another for... Love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. If this, in this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Now let's just summarize this particular passage very quickly. And uh, I'm just going to give you a real brief outline of this particular passage. And then we're going to move on from there and begin to really explore what love is. John said that God is love. He said that in verse 8. When he says that God is love, he means that love is God's nature. Uh, the nature of a living thing determines its fruit. It determines what it produces. And Paul described the fruit of love in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. So the apostle John first said in this passage that God is love. And then he said that God loves us. He said that in verse 10. Because God has a free will, uh, he can choose the objects of his love. And John said that he has chosen us to be the objects. What an honor that is, to be chosen to be the object of someone's love. And so John said that God loves us in verse 10. And then John said that God demonstrated his love toward us by sending his son to atone for our sins. He used the word propitiation. It means to pay for our sins. And he said that in verses 9 and 10. Jesus is the greatest evidence that God really does love us. 
And then John went on to say that because God loves us, that we should love one another. That's, that's a deduction that the Apostle John made, that if God loves us and we believe that he loves us, then we ought to in turn love others. He said that in two different places as well in verses 7 and 11. You see, we were created, the Bible says, in the likeness and the image of God. So if God is love, we were created to love in our original creation. And we exist to glorify God. And we fulfill our highest purpose by loving God and loving others. And then John said that loving one another is the evidence that we are born of God and know God. He said that in verse 7. Just as Jesus is the greatest evidence that God loves us, loving others is the greatest evidence that we are born again of God and that we have become partakers of his divine nature. Can you say amen to that? Well, that could be a sermon all in of itself, right? What I just shared to you in that particular outline as I just broke down for you those five verses. But the truth is, if we're going to understand God and his love, and we're going to understand our responsibility to love one another, we must understand what love means when we say that God is love. In other words, if we don't understand the meaning of love and what it means, then uh, we can't carry out our responsibility and we really don't understand what God is like. We really don't understand what, what it means when you say, God, you are love. What does that mean? You know, society uh, and the family and the church uh, and uh, people that are married, there's a lot of confusion about love and what it actually is. Uh, that confusion was reflected in my life, very early in my life, where, you know, I didn't, wasn't raised in a family where we were told as children by our parents, uh, I love you. That was not something that was said. Uh, I don't remember my father ever saying it to me when I was growing up until maybe I was 17 years old or so and he put it at the end of a letter where basically he would say, love dad, you know. But as far as him just saying, you know, I love you, son, you know, that never happened when I was growing up. And I didn't, uh, my mother passed away when I was three. And as a result of her passing, I really missed out on a lot of what it means to be loved. And I don't think that my situation or experience is unusual from the experiences of a lot of people in our society. And so as a result, a lot of people grow up and really don't understand what love is and what it means to love someone. You know, when I got in junior high and high school and all those hormones, you know, jump into those uh, junior high boys and they began uh, to be attracted to girls, you know, and, uh, and I was an athlete and as a result of being an athlete, then you get to be in the locker room. And we used to talk a lot about locker room talk. What went on in the locker room when the boys were talking? Well, they talked a lot about girls. And they talked a lot about the moral compromises that they were making with the girl that they were dating. You know, the girl that they were dating thought it was a very private thing, that moral compromise that they were making. Uh, but in reality, for many of the guys, it was sort of a way for those guys to demonstrate their masculinity by talk about how far they were able to go with a young girl that they were dating. And we're talking about age 13, age 14, age 15, very young. And as the boys talked in the locker room, those guys that were leading girls to compromise, and they were very proud of it, they would say, you know, you know what you need to do if you want to get a young lady to compromise? All you need to do is just say, I love you. That's what you need to say to her. Well, that's how, that just shows the confusion in our society about love. I mean, for you to lead someone to compromise morally in the name of love is blasphemous. To say I love you to someone and then do something with them that actually brings personal injury to them is not love. Love is not sinning against someone. <laughs> Sin is the transgression of God's law. 
And when we compromise God's law in the way that we relate to other people, we're not loving them. But yet that particular, that particular idea is very prominent in our society. It was prominent back then. It's prominent right now. What it demonstrates is that we're just really confused in our society about love. And certainly the same thing exists in Christian marriages. I mean, I have the opportunity to do a lot of marriage counseling over these last 38 years. And as I sit in front of couples, they will proclaim that they love each other. But the way that they're relating to each other is not in a loving way. It does, it's really not love. In other words, their conduct and their behavior doesn't match their words in the way that they're treating each other. But boy, we love each other. We love each other. <laughs> well, you know, my mentor in the ministry, Bob Burgess, uh, when he was young, his uh, uh, wife, Joy, turned to him one night while they were laying in bed after they were married, and she said to him, Bob, do you love me? And he said to her, there in the dark, she'll never forget it. I've heard her say it, tell this story many times. Bob said, well, I'm here, aren't I? Well, there may be some element of truth to being there for someone that you say that you love, but she was really wanting uh, a much better answer than that one when he said it. And so I've never forgotten that because I've used it not to ever say that to Sandra if she ever asked me that question. You know, so we're confused about what love is in marriage. We really are. What does it mean to love your spouse? There is so much confusion in marriage. And then in families. You know, I, I hear all the time, uh, uh, you know, and I do a lot of family counseling over the years. I've done a lot of that over the years, too. And I hear people talk about how, you know, their family just loves each other. But there's these incredible conflicts within the family that demonstrate by the way that they're relating parents to children or children to parents that they really don't understand what it means to love. And then even in the church, you know, love your brother, love your brother, love your sister, love your sister. It's something that's very commonly said in the church, but yet when you look at how some brothers and sisters relate to each other and treat each other, I want you to know that uh, it's not love. <laughs> when they say that so there's a lot of confusion I want you to understand that the New Testament was originally written in Greek and in the Greek language there are many different Greek words that are all translated love in English in other words when you read through your Bible you may see the word love in your New Testament but it may have a different meaning than what you're thinking unless you understand what Greek word is behind that word love does that make sense our English language is very limited in the way that it communicates on certain things. And certainly when it comes to love, one of the things that's created all the confusion in our society, in our families, and in the church, and in marriage about love is the limited way that we communicate love when we speak to each other. In this message this morning, I want us to answer the question, what is love? And I want you to understanding, understand the meaning of four of these Greek words and how these words reveal what love is and how these four words reveal the nature of God because God is love. And it's very important that you understand the meaning of every one of these words and how uh, how they are expressions of God's love to you. You know, I often say, and I've said it for many years, your theology will determine your meology. Your theology is knowing God and knowing what God is like as far as who he, what he's really like. And as you get to know God and what he's really like, it changes you. That's the way it works. The more I know God, the more he changes me. It just works that way. And the depths of God are unsearchable, right? And so there's always more to know than what I know. You know, what I tell some people, yeah, I may be considered an expert when it comes to the Bible, but you know what? I know, not, I know just enough to be dangerous. 
Well, let's learn some things this morning about love. And let's learn from these four words, Greek words, that are all translated love, whether it's in the Bible or in other literature, they're all translated love. And those four words are agape and phileo, and phileo storgos and eros. So to understand the love of God, we need to understand the meaning of these four words and what the Bible means when it says that God is love and that God loves us. And so let's dive in here this morning and we'll go through this as rapidly as we can. And first we're going to talk about agape, which is translated love in your New Testament. What is agape love? Well, agape love is benevolent love. It is benevolent love because it is charity. And many times in some translations of the New Testament, the word charity is used in the English language rather than the word love. You know, what is charity? Well, you know what charity is. Charity is sacrificing yourself to meet the greatest good of others despite their condition. In other words, you're looking to meet their needs and it's not because they can do something back for you. You're looking to meet their needs and it's not because you think highly of them uh, as far as their own moral character is concerned. Agape love is benevolent love. Agape love is also unconditional love. It is unconditional love because there's nothing the recipient can do to change the nature of the one giving it. In other words, the giving of agape love is not based upon you. It's based upon the, the nature of the one who's giving you that love. And so it's always the same. It never changes. No matter what your condition is, it is unconditional. Agape love is unmerited love. It is given to the recipient even if they have not earned it. I mean, you can give agape love to someone you don't even know. And that happens even in our society at times when we have great tragedies that happen through acts of nature. You see people in our society respond in agape love to people who are suffering that they don't even know. That's happening right now with many people that are donating resources and money to the people of Ukraine and the church of Ukraine. So agape love is unmerited love. Agape love is limitless love. In other words, it's like a water well that just never runs dry. It's, it's always available. It's all, there's more than enough to go around. It's limitless. It is unlimited. And so agape love is all of these things. Now, what you need to understand about this word in the New Testament that's translated love in English is that this particular word is used over 200 times in the New Testament. You know what that indicates is that it has a very prominent place when we began to talk about God being love. Very prominent place. When some one word is used over 200 times uh, in the New Testament. I don't know if you counted when we uh, went over that five verses in 1 John, but the word agape is used 13 times in those five verses that we just read. Agape love is frequently used in those biblical texts that are describing what God has done for us that we have not earned. That it's, it's used in those texts that describes what God has done for us despite our sinful condition. Texts like John 3.16. For God so agape the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So many songs have been written about agape love. Wonderful songs. It's something we ought to sing about. It's such an incredible expression of benevolence. It's just absolutely amazing that God loves us this way. One of those songs says this. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus. It's vast. It's unmeasured. It's boundless. It's free. Rolling as a mighty ocean in its fullness over me underneath me all around me is the current of thy love leading onward leading homeward to thy glorious rest above isn't that the truth about the agape love of God I'm telling you if you really believe what I just said that God loves you and you 
you understand agape, it will change you. It will change you. The second word that we're looking at is phileo love. And phileo love is friendship love. It's the affection that we may feel for someone that we like, someone that we want to be a friend with. Phileo love is being with someone when they're suffering. That's what phileo love does. You go and be with someone when they're suffering. Phileo love is having someone's back when they are wrong. Phileo love is entrusting yourself and what is important to you to someone else that's your friend. And that's why Jesus said in John 15, 15 to his disciples, he said, Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you what? Friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. You see, that's what Jesus does when you become his friend and you become the object of his phileo is that he <laughs> he's there with you when you're suffering he has your back when you're wrong he entrusts himself and what's important to him to you when i say god loves you and the word is phileo it means he wants to be your friend in Scripture, phileo is used 25 times in the New Testament. It's used to describe the love of God the Father and the Son. Isn't that interesting? It's not just agape that the Father and the Son share. It's phileo that they share, friendship. It's also used of Jesus and Peter and their relationship. And in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the word phileo is used to describe the love that was shared by Jonathan and David in, the, in their relationship. When the Bible says that God phileos us, it means God is fond of us. Isn't that incredible? That God is fond of us and he desires friendship with us. You know, what makes this as incredible is how we have treated him. You know, it's he, that he wants to be our friend after the way that we have responded to his love is just absolutely amazing. Being a friend of God is also incredible because God can do what other friends cannot do. Do you understand that part of this? That God as a friend can do for you what other friends can't do for you? You say, well, what are those things? Well, first of all, it's all about his attributes. He's always present. There's not a friend that can always be present with you, no matter how much they love you. But God is always present with you as your friend. And not only is he present with you, he has unlimited power to help you as a friend. You know, every other friend that I have, there are some that have more power than others, but all of them have limitations to their power to help me when I have a need. But God has unlimited power as a friend to help us. And then God promises that he will never leave us or forsake us. And he's the only friend you got that can keep that promise. I tell people when it's time for you to die, if you're cognitive that death is approaching, now there's no one else that can walk through that door of death with you but Jesus himself. You know, it's really true both before though. And if you come to an awareness of this truth, it's going to be so important to you moving forward in your faith in God that everyone else who is your friend, even your closest friend, can't be there for, for you and do for you what God can do. I mean, Jonathan and David pledged themselves to this incredible friendship to each other where they were more loyal to one another than Jonathan was even to his own father because his father was misrepresenting Jehovah God. But you know what? There came a point where Jonathan passed away. And David lost his friend, and he grieved over his friend, but I want you to know there was one friend that sticks closer than a brother, and that was Jehovah God. That is Jesus Christ. You know, what a friend we have in Jesus all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer. The Lord Jesus Christ. Man, what 
a friend. Hopefully, I'm impacting your theology right now. If I'm impacting your theology, it's going to affect your meology, how you relate to yourself and how you relate to others. And then there's this Greek word called philo or phileo storgos. Now, what in the world does that mean? Well, phileo storgos, love, is family love, is what it is. Family love. (laughs) It is a love that welcomes you to be a part of a community that is bigger than yourself. That's what phileo storgos is. It is a love that gives you a place to have a significant role in your community. It is a love that makes you feel important to the community. That's what this kind of love is. It is a love that makes you feel like you belong to something that's more significant than yourself. You know, this kind of love is very important for parents to give their children. And that's why the husband and the wife really need to work hard (laughs) at loving each other the right way. Because you can't give this kind of community to your children unless you've got a strong marriage. Right? Right? You get it? How one leads to the other? If you want your children to really have this sense of community in your home, then it starts with mom and dad really loving each other, really agape each other, really filleting each other. And it creates this sense of community that those children benefit from in their own lives so it's what parents should give their children it's what children should give to their parents man I just love it when my children call on me to check on me what they're saying to me is dad I know you're old you know and you're you're wearing out and all of that but you're still useful to us and we still need you dad they make me feel a part of their community by reaching out to me what they're demonstrating to me in those moments is this phileo storgus love It is what siblings should give to one another. And I want you to know that as a father, one of my greatest thrills is watching my children love each other with this kind of love. Where they still, no matter, got one on the East Coast and one on the West Coast, and what are they doing? They're still trying to make each other feel a part of this community that we call family. They're demonstrating to each other this kind of love. It's what grandparents should give to their grandchildren. You need to... Create this sense of love in your, with your grandchildren so that they feel the sense of community that they're a part of that's bigger than themselves. And folks, it's what church members should give to other members. And by the way, it's one of the main reasons why we renamed our church Together Church. It's the meaning of this word, love. I mean, that's what should happen when people walk in the doors of our church. They should feel a sense of, wow, community. You know, a sense of belonging. They should feel uh, phileo storgus love is what they should feel. This particular love is what many businesses and teams have as one of their values because they've come to understand that it's important to their organization to make everyone feel that they're a part of community that's bigger than themselves. And it's important to their organization uh, to create a place where every person in the organization, every team member has a significant role in that particular community. We all need this phileo storgus love. You know, due to the breakdown of the family, where this should start, <laughs> and the breakdown in the church, Satan is using this love to attract people to all kinds of perversions of the truth. <laughs> this includes cults. What do they do? They use this form of love to trap people. Is what they do in cults. It, intru- it includes gangs. What do gangs do? What do gang leaders do? Well, they actually lo- use this kind of love to draw people into their gangs. This is what radical political groups do. And this is what is happening right now in the LGBTQ community. They make you feel like you belong. They make you feel that you're a part of something that's bigger than yourself. They make you feel that you have an important role to play in their community. This word for love is not even used in the Bible. Isn't that interesting? 
It's not even used in the Bible to describe God, his nature, or even the church. But what we need to recognize is that even though it's not used directly, the concept is there in so many texts and passages. For example, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. I want you to see if you can see it in this passage, this, this community love, this family love. But you are a chosen generation, Peter said. Wow, chosen. What does that make you feel? Well, it makes you feel apart, right? When someone tells you that you've been chosen, you are a royal priesthood. My goodness. A holy nation. And then it says this, his own special people. <laughs> right? What's God doing there? He's communicating this, this familial love that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness to his marvelous light. You've got a significant role to play, according to 1 Peter chapter 2. Who were once not a people, but now you are what? The people of God who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Wow. God's word is just filled with examples of God saying, you're welcome in my community. You're important in my community. We want you to be a part. I want you to be a part. One of those songs that uh, reflects this familial love is that song that says, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. We used to sing it all the time back in the day. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood, joint heirs with Jesus as we travel this saw, for I'm part of the family, the family of God. And then the last one today is eros love. And this is one of the most controversial words uh, in, as far as preaching is concerned. And uh, I'm going to give you a perspective that maybe you've never had before about this particular word I'm going to give you a positive perspective about this kind of love and I think it's important that you have your perspective challenged about what eros love really is you know what eros love is at its essence eros love is the desire to be one with another person that's what it is in the essence of its meaning and this could mean one spiritually one emotionally, one mentally, or it could mean one physically. Now, Satan has used the desire we all have for eros, oneness, and perverted humanity with fornication and adultery and homosexuality and all kinds of other things that he has used to take advantage of this need that we have within us to be one with God and to be one with his people. God's word says that Eros love is not holy unless it's satisfied within covenant. Oh my goodness, think about that. That's what makes Eros love holy or sanctified when it's being satisfied within covenant. You know, by the time the New Testament was written, the Greeks defined Eros as only sexual in nature which is really a disservice to its meaning. The word eros is used in the Septuagint, which once again, the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. The Septuagint was written in the 3rd century B.C., before Christ. It was written by 70 Jewish scholars from which it derives its name. It is the oldest and most important complete translation of the Hebrew Bible that was made by the Jews. And it was used, the word eros was used in the Septuagint. Here's an example of how eros was used in the Septuagint in a positive way. It's Proverbs 4, 6. And forsake it not, and it shall cleave thee. Love it. That's the word eros in the Septuagint. And it shall keep thee. It's talking about wisdom. And notice that it says cleave to wisdom. In other words, become one with wisdom. We know that wisdom in the book of Proverbs represents Christ the Messiah its admonishment here is become one with wisdom become one with Christ it is true that this word eros was used most frequently in the Septuagint when God was rebuking his people it was used many times in those rebukes God was rebuking his people because they were seeking to be one with other lovers instead of seeking oneness with him an example of that is Ezekiel 16, 38, 6. 
It says, Thus saith the Lord, Because thou hast poured out forth thy money, therefore thy shame shall be discovered in thy harlotry with thy lovers. Lovers, there is the word eros in the Septuagint. And with regard to all the imaginations of thine iniquities, and for the blood of thy children which thou hast given to them. They were sacrificing their children to their other lovers. They were seeking through the sacrifice of their children to become one with these idols rather than seeking oneness with Jehovah God. Many biblical scholars believe the word eris was left out of the epistles written by Paul and the other New Testament writers because it would have been interpreted incorrectly by its Greek recipients based on what the word eris had come to mean in Greek-speaking societies. Even though the word eris is not used in the New Testament, the concept is there. It's all about wanting oneness. The Word of God emphatically states that God wants to make a covenant with us, and He wants to be what? One with us. And He wants us to what? Be one with one another. Jesus said this in John chapter 17 and verse 20. As he was praying for his disciples and the future church of, that was going to be born at Pentecost, he said, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be what? One. As you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they all may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the Lord which you gave me, I have given them. And the, and the glory which you gave me, I have given them that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. You know, the Bible says that God is very passionate about being one with us. You know, <clears throat> when I was young and I uh, fell in love with my late wife, Debbie. I can't tell you how passionate I was. I couldn't measure it about becoming one with her. And it wasn't just a physical oneness. I wanted to be one with her spiritually. I wanted to be one with her emotionally. I wanted to be one with her mentally. You know, the way the Bible expresses this is I wanted to know her. I wanted to know her. I wanted to know her to be one with her. Wow. It was an incredible feeling to have that, you know, kind of passion. But I want you to understand something. Whatever passion human beings can have to be one with one another, the passion of God far exceeds that passion to be one with his people. Now let me say to you, if you will change your theology and believe what I just said, it will totally change your life. You will not be the same if you believe what I just said. If you reject what I just said, you're going to continue to be immature in your understanding of love. If you don't really believe and understand that the God of creation, the Lord of all, wants to be one with you, You're always going to remain immature in your love. You're always going to be looking to other things to satisfy your need to be loved rather than depending on God. <laughs> I had a man one day, I was talking to him about this, and I could see in his eyes he didn't believe a word I was saying, just like I can see it in some of your eyes this morning. It's like you don't believe a word I'm saying right now. That God really wants to be one with you. And I was saying this to him, and I was probably sharing it with great enthusiasm as I shared it with him. And he looked at me, and he said this to me, and it let me know he did not understand. He looked at me after I finished, and he said, but Jerry, he said, God can't hold you. God can't hold you. Yeah, God may want to be one with you, but he can't hold you. I said to him, you're missing out. What God can do for you is better than being held. God can fill you with his spirit. And when God fills you with his spirit, folks, let me tell you something. It's better than being held by any human being.
But that will not happen for you, folks, unless you believe that this God, this almighty God, he wants to be one with you spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically. He wants you to know him and he wants to know you. And you know what? You say, well, he already knows me. Hey, this is a relationship. He's all knowing. He knows everything about you. But you know what? He wants you to tell him what's going on. That's one of the purposes of prayer. It's for you to say, you know, God, what I'm feeling right now is just a lot of anxiety. And he doesn't go, well, I knew that. Don't, you don't have to talk to me. I know that. Now, see, some of your parents may respond to you that way. But that's not the way God responds. When you're honest with God about the way you're feeling, you know why he delights in that? He delights in it because you're demonstrating faith in him that he wants to be one with you do you have that kind of faith in god that he wants to be one with you you know we have this this need to be loved and we have this need to love and this need to be one with others is so important because when we become one with others beginning with god it enables us to do things that are beyond our ability. I mean, come on. God created Adam, and what did he say after he created Adam? It's not good for you to be alone. huh? It was the only thing God said that wasn't good when he created it. Why wasn't it good? Because he could not accomplish by himself, Adam, what God wanted him to accomplish without Eve. And in order to reproduce, he needed to be one with Eve. And that's why in Genesis chapter 2, when you have the, the first marriage terms issued by God, God, it says right there in the word, a man shall leave his father and mother and what? Cleave to his wife, become one with his wife. And then it says, and, and the two shall become what? One flesh. Hey, two together is better than one. You can accomplish things together with God and with others that you can never accomplish by yourself. God wants us. God wants us to be one with him, and he wants us to be one with others within covenant. God has given us his spirit to dwell in us so that we can be one with him. So when the Bible says that God is love, I want you to think about this from now on. I don't want you to ever forget this. When the Bible says that God is love and it says that God loves you like it did in 1 John there in chapter 2, here's what it means. Here's what I want you to think about. God wants to serve your greatest good despite your condition. Isn't that amazing? No matter where you're at in the moment, God wants to serve your greatest good. He never changes. God wants you to be his friend. He wants you to be his friend. God wants you to be a member of his family. He wants you to have that sense of belonging in his community. And God wants you to be one with him. He wants to be one with you. What an incredible God we serve. And in this love that I just described is the nature of God. It's who God is. And he'll never change. He is the same today. He, he's the same yesterday. He's the same today and same forever. And he is the only one who can satisfy your need to be loved. Man, May the 1st, 2007. 2007 is the year of Sandra lost her husband and I lost my wife that year. May the 1st was a day when my son William was 10 years old and he had professed faith in Christ and his mother wanted to see him baptized before she died. And we knew that her time was short. So on May the 1st, we arranged, with I, Greg Werner helped me, arranged for him to be baptized at our house where Debbie was. And he, he got one of those uh, big troughs that you put livestock water in, brought it out, put it on the, the, the back porch, and it was just a few feet from her face. She was behind the patio doors in our bedroom. I can still see her face, and I can still see her smile that day. And, 
And there, right there, and, and we invited people to come. And my goodness, it was in the middle of the afternoon. And a bunch of folks showed up. Maybe you were there on our back patio to see William baptized right there and his mother watching him being baptized. And I baptized William that day in that, in that water. And I raised him up. And as I raised him up, Two white doves flew right over us. Wow. I didn't see it, but others saw it. And they just sort of saw that as a sign from God that God was pleased with what we were doing. You know, at 1.20 in the afternoon, some 48 hours after that happened, Debbie left us to go to heaven. And our family stood around her bed. After she passed and we prayed, we prayed and we thank God. We thank God for the way that she loved us all. And we thank God with many tears for the way that she loved us all. She was gone. She was gone. We were all devastated by her loss. But here's one thing we knew. God was not gone. God was the same. <laughs> he loved us. And he was going to be there for us no matter what happened moving forward. He wanted to be our friend. <laughs> we, are, we, remember, we lost a member of our family that day, but we didn't lose him. And we were still a part of his family. And he wanted to be one with us even in our grief and our sorrow. He shared that with us from that day forward. Let me tell you something, folks. When you experience that kind of devastation, the only way that you're going to really survive and thrive is if you know the love of God the way I described it today. I want to encourage you today. Whatever you believed about God, God's love, if it's wrong, change it today. Believe the truth about God's love for you. You can't experience it until you come to believe it. Would you pray with me this morning? If you're here this morning and you've never received the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and become his follower, I want to invite you to do that right now. You've heard about the love of God for you this morning. What an incredible love it is. But you can't know the love of God without first believing that he loves you. And the way that he has demonstrated that love for you is he sent his son Jesus to die for your sin. To suffer your judgment for sin. So that you don't have to suffer for it. To give you his life. For you to experience his love. And I want to invite you right now, just right where you're sitting. If you've never prayed to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and the Holy Spirit has been working in your heart, been drawing you to him, I want to encourage you right now, don't wait. <laughs> There's no reason to wait. Just turn to him right now and say, Lord Jesus, I want you. I want your love. I receive you as my personal Savior and Lord. Would you do that right now? Just say that right to him right now. I receive you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Now, if you just prayed to receive Jesus, you need to profess your faith in him. You need to go public with it. And the way you go public with receiving Jesus is to follow him in baptism. And I want to encourage you, if you've received Jesus, follow him in baptism like the Bradfords did this morning, like many others have done. And we want to help you with that. We want to help you with that. So you need to communicate with us. You can call our church off and say, hey, I need to talk to a pastor and we'll connect with you. Or you can fill out a connect card that's in the chair in front of you and leave it today on the chair or put it in the offering baskets on your way out. And we'll connect with you and talk to you about being baptized. Would you do that? For those of you that have already received Jesus, I want you to mature in your love. 
But the only way you're going to mature in your love for others is if you mature in your faith and God's love for you. That's where it all begins. You change as that changes. I want to encourage you as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to encourage you. Believe the truth about God. Believe the truth about his love for you. Accept it. Just say, I accept it, Lord. I've tried to satisfy my need to be loved in so many places, and it's all been a bunch of empty cisterns. And Lord, right now, <laughs> I'm turning my will completely over to you. And I'm asking you to fill me up with your great love. You know, when you begin to really depend on God's love, what happens is you become a person who loves others like God loves you. You'll never rise above loving others. You'll never grow in that ability to love others until you grow in your understanding of God's love for you. If you believe that God loves you the way I described it this morning, what will happen to you is you'll begin to respond to people who hurt you rather than reacting to them. You'll stop engaging in harmful relationships trying to satisfy your need for love. And you'll begin to live a life that's focused upon just serving others in love because you see it's like a well and that water within you just could continually satisfied your need to be loved and so now you're free because you're not having to seek it all these other places you're just free to pour it out to others that's the way God wants it to be that's the way Jesus described it would be when we are filled with his spirit and let me tell you folks being filled with his spirit is being filled with his love don't you want that Christian aren't you ready to turn that corner aren't you ready to go deeper in him well, then believe this truth. God loves you. Would you? Would you believe it? Let's stand together. We're going to sing a song this morning. This will be our closing benediction this morning as Seth leads us this morning. Let's put our faith in God as we leave this place and let's be his people of love wherever we go. Seth leads us.